On October the 7th, 1932, a highly experimental aircraft prepared for its first flight. This was the Stipa Caproni, or the Caproni Stipa, depending on who you talk to. It was designed by Luigi Stipa and built by Giovanni Caproni's aircraft company. Though it may have looked like the strange love child of a GB racer and a dustbin, it was in fact an innovative design that, despite appearances, was completely flyable and represented an early example of ducted fan technology. Now, while the Stipa Caproni may have been an odd, blustery, and somewhat terrifying machine, the sponsor of today's video, Endil, is a far more relaxing affair. Do you have a hard time focusing on your daily tasks? Do you find your productivity suffering due to stress or anxiety? Or do you find that the sweet embrace of sleep never quite arrives and you spend six hours staring at your ceiling in a muted rage? Endor could very well be the solution for you. Endol is an environment-based, non-profit app that takes everything we know about sound and combines it with cutting-edge technology. The app provides real-time, personalised soundscapes designed to help you relax, focus and sleep. It's informed by science, created with science and backed by science. The app has five modes. Wind down, focus, relax, sleep and move. Now, it won't come as a huge surprise that reading through dense aviation textbooks for six hours a day can get pretty dry, and as I am easily distracted by pretty much everything under the sun, I found the focus mode on Endel's app particularly helpful. The soundscape was really, really relaxing, and it sort of enveloped me, but not in an intrusive way, and I was able to blast through hours of research without interruption or my mind wandering. As an added bonus, I also found it much, much easier to switch off and fall asleep at night using Endel's sleep mode, which has been a blessed relief, seeing as I've currently got a family of possums performing a tap dance routine on my roof. Speaking of added bonuses, the first 100 viewers to download Endel using the link below will get a free week to try out Endel for themselves and enjoy all of those soothing soundscapes. Once again, thank you to Endel for sponsoring today's video, and now, let's take a closer look at the Caproni Stipa. In the early 1930s, the Italian fascist government wanted to showcase the success of Italian technology, and in particular, they wanted to show off their best advances in the field of aviation, a topic of international prestige. Italy had already achieved notable success with commercial aircraft, such as the Savoia Marchetti S55, but the Air Ministry wanted something that was cutting edge, something that had not been attempted before, and thus their attention was quickly caught by a radical new design submitted by Luigi Stipa. Born in 1900, Luigi Stipa was interested in engineering from a young age. Unfortunately, the First World War interrupted his education, and he spent the latter years of the war serving as a sharpshooter. Following this, he returned to his education and spent the post-war years earning academic degrees in aeronautical, hydraulic and civil engineering. He then found himself a job with the Italian Air Ministry, where he worked his way up to the position of General Inspector of the Engineering Division. During the mid to late 1920s, he began to work on several theories for making aircraft more efficient. As a hydraulic engineer, he knew that the velocity of a fluid increased as the diameter of the tube through which it passed narrowed. Called Bernoulli's principle, the relationship between the velocity and the pipe diameter was a well-understood axiom of fluid dynamics by the 1920s. Applying Bernoulli's principle to airflow, Stipa believed he could increase the efficiency of an aircraft's engine by directing the prop wash through a venturi tube. Stipa called his concept an intubed propeller. He designed, built, and tested several aircraft models that featured this new concept, and after multiple iterations had gone through rigorous wind tunnel experiments, Stipa believed he had worked out the optimum shapes which the propeller and tube would be designed to. As it turned out, the optimal shape for the tube's inner surface turned out to be almost exactly identical to that of an aerofoil, and so, in many ways, the tubular fuselage of his design essentially resembled that of a wing that had been rolled up into a tubular shape. Stipa published his findings in the Bravista Aeronautica, along with design drawings for a single-engine test aircraft. 
He then approached his superiors at the Air Ministry about the possibility of building his plane, and the Minister for Aeronautics, keen to showcase new innovations, almost immediately agreed. The decision was made to build a small aircraft that was to be powered by a 120 horsepower engine. This was not the ideal outcome for the realisation of the design, but rather it represented a compromise. Firstly, building a smaller aircraft would of course save money, and if the endeavour turned out to be a failure, then the loss would be reduced. And secondly, there had been no major wind tunnel tests done on larger complete models, and so there was no data available to determine the manoeuvrability, aerodynamics, and general behaviour of a larger design. However, on the flip side, it was acknowledged that Steeper's design was written out with larger aircraft in mind, and indeed it was considered poorly suited for smaller ones. But with the Ministry reluctant to finance a larger project, for the reasons mentioned just before, Luigi Steeper had to make do with what he had. Eventually, he came to an agreement with the Air Ministry, and they contracted the Caproni Aviation Company to construct the experimental prototype. As regular viewers of this channel already know, Count Gianni Caproni was no stranger to experimental designs. You only have to look at the CA-16 over Plano, or the CA-90, to get clear evidence of that. And as a result of these adventurous designs, his company was probably the most qualified in Italy to take on the challenge of realising Steeper's theory. In terms of its construction, the aircraft in general was rather simple, but it featured some notable changes from the wind tunnel models that I will cover shortly. As mentioned earlier, the tubular fuselage resembled a wing that had been rolled up, and as such its construction closely resembled that of normal wings as well. It had two strong main rings, which could be considered large circular spars. On these spars were mounted longitudinal ribs, which were similar in design to wing ribs, and these were braced by a series of smaller spars, which were again circular like the main ones. The elliptical wings looked almost comically flimsy, but that was only a visual effect courtesy of the fuselage's size. These wings were built in the traditional manner, being made of wood with a fabric covering, and to improve strength, the wing spars ran along almost the entire span, passing through both the tubular fuselage and the engine nacelle itself. At the rear, the rudder and horizontal stabilisers were mounted onto the trailing edge of the fuselage. It was hoped that by placing the rudder and elevator in the path of the air pushed back by the propeller, they would allow a superior level of control, and so in turn the size of the control surfaces could be reduced. In the end, this reduction would never take place, and in fact it would be later suggested that their size be increased rather than decreased. The 120 horsepower engine took the form of the four-cylinder de Havilland Gypsy 3. This drove the so-called Intude propeller, which was a two-blade fixed-pitch wooden unit that fit snugly within the dimensions of the fuselage. This engine was supported by a frame that was connected, along with the wing spars, to the main circular spars of the fuselage. When first completed, the engine was housed in a small nacelle, however there is evidence that this was removed on multiple occasions, though it is unclear if this was to test the effects of the aircraft's handling, or if this was due to some sort of heating or cooling issue. Now I mentioned earlier that the prototype featured several differences compared to the original wind tunnel models. Some of these differences are worth noting as they directly impacted the performance of the aircraft. Firstly, to simplify the construction, the tubular fuselage was redesigned to be symmetrical. In Steeper's original design, the fuselage was dissymmetrical so that it could generate a certain amount of lift, even at zero angle of attack, but with the new changes this lift was reduced, while at the same time overall drag increased. Secondly, the wings were braced by four steel wires, whereas on the original wind tunnel model this was not the case. It's unclear whether this was an oversight by Luigi Steeper, or whether it was the result of further investigations that deemed it necessary to reinforce the wings in this way. Regardless of the decision, this, and the changes to the fuselage, affected the overall drag, which meant that the estimated top speed, climb rate, and general handling characteristics of the aircraft would not match the predictions of the earlier wind tunnel tests. 
But even with the negative effects of these modifications, the plane was expected to be perfectly airworthy, and so construction continued as planned. For those who first gazed upon it, it must have been a rather strange sight, and while Caproni was silently adding another sticker to his weird aircraft design bingo card, the tubular plane was made ready for its first test flights. The date of the first flight was October the 7th, 1932, and despite some suspicious glances from onlookers, the pilot already had some praise for it before it even left the ground. Since the propeller diameter was the same as that of the fuselage, the steeper Caproni sat very low to the ground, and thanks to a fairly wide undercarriage, this meant that it had excellent ground handling characteristics. That being said, it did look rather comical when it was being taxied around the airfield before taking off. Flying the aircraft was Caproni test pilot Domenico Antonini, a veteran test pilot who had flown many of Caproni's more bizarre designs, such as the huge CA-90 biplane for example. After pottering around the airfield to get a feel for the engine and the throttle, Antonini powered up and the barrel-like plane took off for the first time. Overall, the aircraft behaved well in the air, and Antonini found it easy to handle. Following the first successful flight, a series of test flights were conducted to gather data and evaluate the soundness of Luigi Steeper's theory. These first tests did indeed confirm that the design seemed to make more efficient use of the engine compared to a more conventional design. Though the redesign of the fuselage had reduced the additional lift it provided, it still created enough that it had a superior climb rate over a conventional aircraft with the same engine, and it also had a very low takeoff and landing speed of just 68 kilometers an hour. It was also incredibly stable, in fact it was sometimes too stable, with subsequent test pilots complaining that it was difficult to pull the aircraft into banked turns. What was unknown to both Steeper and Caproni at the time, but was later revealed by further testing, was that the tubular fuselage generated far more lift than expected. As such, the required wing area for stable flight was less than what was designed, and had further models been built, the overall wing size could have been much smaller. Although the design increased the efficiency of the aircraft, in terms of engine power required for lift, the design also created so much drag that it essentially cancelled out any of its benefits. As a result of this, the aircraft was slower than expected, reaching a top speed of just 131 km an hour, with the engine threatening disintegration if it was pushed any further. Some of this aerodynamic drag was created by the modifications made during construction, but some of it was created by the intubed propeller design in general. Ultimately, the low-powered engine and bulky propeller were not enough to take advantage of Bernoulli's principle and generate superior thrust, and so when the aircraft was handed over to the Regia Aeronautica for testing, it failed to outperform conventional designs. Though it was reviewed favourably by Air Force test pilots, the decision was made to cancel further development, and no additional prototypes were built. This was a huge disappointment to Steeper, and Caproni as well, who had come to appreciate the potential of the design. Steeper had designed and built several models for larger aircraft, specifically flying wings equipped with two or four ensued propellers, and they tried to secure funding for a new project, however these attempts ultimately failed. Had a larger prototype been built, it could well have been very easy to fly, if the Steeper Caproni was anything to go by, but this flight of fancy would never come to pass. Though the Air Ministry didn't embrace Steeper's design, it didn't stop them and the Italian government from using it as a propaganda tool. Steeper patented his intubed propeller design in Germany and in the United States, and his work was published in multiple countries. In fact, a large amount of my source material comes from a NACA technical memorandum that was written up in 1934. Unfortunately, this remarkable aircraft was eventually scrapped, but a 3 to 5 scale replica was built in Australia in the 1990s. It was built by Lynette Zaculli and Aerotech Queensland, and it made at least two flights in 2001. It's unclear if the replica was ever flown again after this, but it can be found on display at the Toowoomba airfield, which is not too far away from where I live, so maybe I'll do a follow-up video where I go and pay it a visit. 
Although Italy made no further efforts to develop Steeper's design, a more advanced derivative would be realised in 1940, though the Caproni Campini N1 was nowhere near efficient enough to be practical, it did make use of a ducted fan compressor buried in the fuselage, and by adding additional fuel to a combustion chamber in the tail, it gave Italy the laudable claim of producing the world's first afterburning aircraft. But that's a story for another day. As always, thank you all so much for watching, and I also apologise if my voice sounds a bit off with this one, and for the next few videos, Right before I went away on my holiday, I started coming down with a cold, which obviously makes my voice sound a bit more rubbish than usual, so apologies for that. And of course, thank you all to the patrons, including the Wing Commander tier patrons. I shall be updating the list as soon as I get back home, but as always, thank you all so much for watching, and I'll catch you all next time. Goodbye.